Welcome inside episode 571 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains. And today, our draft rankings become contentious. We are counting down prospects 38 through 36, but a few of our scouts think two of these guys should be top 15 lottery picks. And Ross, if you like goals, Game 1 of the Western Conference Finals was for you. 14 goals scored in just the first glimpse of the battle of McKinnon versus McDavid. It did not disappoint. And tonight, we get a goalie-friendly matchup. Shesterkin versus Vasilevsky will take a peek in to the Stanley Cup playoffs in Quebec City. Get your own team. The Sens ain't coming, not even for one game. We'll t- tell you why and more. This is the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Senators your first listen on this Wednesday, June 1st. We are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube, where the best way to help us grow is to like the video by clicking the thumbs up, subscribing to the channel, and leaving a comment below. What would you say to the CEO of Quebecer, who was trying to poach our Senators for five games in Quebec City? CTV reporting yesterday that that deal is done. Pilsy, we love Quebec City. We hope they get a team, but not ours. Yeah, and we went over this in an episode a couple weeks ago when the first news of this broke out. And the thing was, they wanted to do regular season games in Quebec City for the Sens. And that just doesn't make any sense. Like, the Senators finally feel like we're turning a corner here. Fans are coming out to the games. Hopefully no more COVID restrictions. Like it just seems like the most bizarre timing ever to be like, okay, we're finally going to be able to have some positivity here and fans are going to show up to the arena. Let's take away some of those home games and take away some of those opportunities and give them to another city to make a couple extra bucks. No, can't happen. Won't happen. Not happening. No. And the CEO's name is Pierre Carl. Pelado, and he says that the death of former Senators owner Eugene Melnick has ended the conversations, saying that they're still interested in bringing hockey to Quebec, but it's not going to happen. They would have been the company providing the Senators with a financial package. These would have been regular season games. You only get 41 of these per year, and over the past two years, how many have been at full capacity, Pilsy? Like 20% of them, if that. And Senators... they haven't even got 41 home games every year. Like yeah. They've got much less than that, usually. So Sens, Sens fans deserve to support their own team, and uh, I don't see any. I'm sure, and maybe we'll have a Quebec City correspondent. Beautiful this time of year. But I don't know if I'm seeing any Senators jerseys walking around um, the Chateau Frontenac up there or the Plains of Abraham. I don't know if it's a Sens town, Pilsy. I think it might be a little more closer to a Habs town. Even still, you see lots of uh, Nordiques flags and all yep. that. We hope the Nordiques come back. We really do. But I would prefer the Senators to stay at Ottawa. And that seems the way it's going. We also asked out on Twitter, give us a provocative topic to discuss today. We've got draft rankings coming up in a bit. But as always, you don't disappoint on Twitter at Send Central. Let's pull up. And we'll just go through this. we got the screen sharing tool, so we may as well use it so people can follow along. If you're watching on Twitter, Pilsy, I'll just rapid fire some, some of these questions for you and, uh, and we'll go from there, all right? Alex Lawler saying, if a roster player is going to be shipped out for a top six winger this offseason, who do you think has the best likelihood of being moved? Well, judging by Alex Lawler's uh, profile picture there, he's probably not going to like my answer, but I think Alex Formington is the most likely guy. He's the guy that holds the most value, and he's the kind of player that is still under control enough that other teams can be like, okay, we can bank on the upside here, the speed, the penalty killing, the breakaway effects of Flash Formington, and we're willing to bet on him, and we can maybe try to get a future top six guy in return for a current top six guy. So Formanton would be my best answer. The only problem with that, this kid scored 18 goals. He's 21 years old. Like at what point is he kind of a main piece? That would be too reminiscent for me of the Matthew Shane trade where you're giving up 
a talented two and say what you want about Turris's career kind of falling off a cliff after he left, yeah. but you're giving up a guy who the reason why Ottawa needs a top six forward is to push Formanton onto the third line to yep. make that effective. You move Formanton. Yeah, sure. You're getting a good top six, but now you have a hole in the bottom six. So I think that the play is to try to avoid using a roster player. You have cap space. It's not like it has to be player in player out for cap implications. It would, it would just be because you think it's a better fit. You, why, why did you have 10 picks in the 2020 draft? You can't play them all at the same time. I think that's where you get into the conversation of what kind of value does a Roby Jarventi have, a Ridley Gregg have. And I love Ridley. I know some people have him as an untouchable, but these are the conversations where how can you best control this roster? And Formanton is a controllable asset with an RFA status for this year, and I believe two more after that. So I just think that if if you're looking at moving a roster player, you better be damn sure you're getting a legitimate upgrade from a guy who I think Foreman could score 23, 24 goals next year. He could have done that with just a bit better finishing. He's getting chances. And that's when you know that a player is not going to regress. If anything, this kid's career is just going to continue to move in the right direction. So to answer your question, Alex, I'm, you know what? Just to be different, Pilsy, I'll say Connor Brown because he's going into the final year of his deal yeah. at 3.6 million. Very affordable for a team like Minnesota, who is very cap-strapped for the next couple of years. You get eat half of his. Who wouldn't want Connor Brown at a ton of value at $1.8 million per season? Well, the Minnesota Wild might not, Ross, because then that's just a pure rental. Because Connor Brown's next True. contract is going to be $4 million plus for well, sure. And look what Zach Hyman's done now in a different situation outside of Toronto. Those two, for yep. me, both coming up with the Marlies and starting their career in Toronto, very comparable players. Yeah, I, I would agree. And that's why I pointed towards Formanton first, because I feel like the Senators can have younger players under control that can come up and take Formanton's place, but they don't have a Connor Brown ready to take Connor Brown's place. So that's where I would say, and they have the cap space, like you mentioned, so they can afford to keep Connor Brown if they so choose. So that's why I went that route. But yeah, I would say number one roster player to be put in the trade, Formanton. Number two, Connor Brown. Do not touch Shane. <laughs> nope. Timmy underscore goat. Karis underscore Clark says, could Jake Sanderson take over Thomas Shabbat's role as a number one defense? And we can do a whole episode on this, Pilsy. Let's rapid fire through the rest of these because they are there's a lot coming in. It's awesome, the engagement. We want to be able to show people out and they can see your handles on Twitter. Everyone go follow each other. Super inclusive. And let's get this sense fandom going into next season. I want Twitter to just be electric. And we got to shout out the sense Twitter account. We'll do that in the next segment. But could Jake Sanderson take over as the number one defensive Pilsy? And if so, how long would it take? That's That second part of your question is the real part of the question we need to answer. Because I think it is possible, but I don't think it's as soon as people think. Like, I think some people are like, oh, in two years, he's probably going to be there. I think it's going to be three, four, maybe even five years. Because not because I'm knocking Jake Sanderson and downplaying him. But do not disrespect Thomas Shabbat. And he's still that's getting better. Here. Exactly. He's still getting better. He like Give Thomas Shabbat a defense partner that wasn't found in the bottom of the scrap pile of free agency. And then maybe we can talk about how good he actually is. 100%. Okay. We've got Sens AJ11. Which prospect other than Jake Sanderson, nice little connective tissue right there, could make the jump and make an immediate impact? I'll add the word immediate. Uh, there like is it Greg Sokolov I like Crookshank's name in there we saw him training hard on his Instagram love to see a redemption story from Angus Crookshank one of our favorite dudes in the organization oh, yeah. absolutely Crook is the best uh, I, I'm gonna go off the board here and say it's not going to be a forward if it's gonna be anyone it's gonna be Ooh. a defenseman in Lassie or JBD that's gonna be one of the best training camp battles to watch yep. for Lassie versus JBD this is not a question, but I love it from Nez Bedard. The Sen should absolutely trade for William Nylander. Say what you want about William Nylander, but if you scrape off the leaf pile from on top of him, there's a hell of a player in there. How do you think he would fit alongside Tim Stutzla? I I hate it, but I like it. Because well, Pilsy, the problem with William Nylander right now is he's playing with a centerman who has cement in his skates. Imagine if him and Timmy Put him were with flying. Chris Tierney. 
Well, I mean, John Tavares. That's what the Sens probably would do. John Tavares is like the Fairmont version of Chris Tierney. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's the, I, I hate it because William Nylander is just such a classic Leafs player. But <laughs> yeah. how, like, the ammunition. He might score 50. He might the score ammunition 50. ammunition we would have if he scores big goals or actually performs in the playoffs versus the Leafs as a senator would be all time. So for, for that reason, I'm in. All Let's right. Let's do it, Nez. Scabs underscore says, why do people Scabs. love Spezza? All right. <laughs> love Spezza, but hate Heatley. They did the uh, same thing and only played half their time in Ottawa. This show is of the mind that we need to bring Danny Heatley back into the alumni. We form. are forgiving Danny Heatley. Yes, it's been enough time. And I, I think maybe Scabs, I'm not sure how, how old he is. But if you were around when Danny Heatley was asking, demanding to be traded... There were some hard feelings there. Whereas Spezza, I think it kind of made sense. Like the year when he was named captain, it Brutal. just didn't work out. And th- you could you could see the writing on the wall. And the Sens were like, he's not going to want to come back here. So let's get some value for him. Yeah. And that's what they did. 100%. And with Danny Heatley, I think if he had accepted that first trade to Edmonton, we're not having the same conversations. The fact you demanded a trade, <laughs> they had a trade ready for you. And he's like, no, nah, but I don't want to go there. Yeah. So, I but think he, in in hindsight, I'm glad he did because I think the San Jose trade was much better. Oh, shout out Milan McCulloch for Hell sure. Yeah. The last after, before Josh Norris, him and Jason Spezza, the last Senators to reach 30 goals in a single season. I'm of the mind. Let's get Danny Eatley back in the fold. I know that's a polarizing topic. We could do a whole episode on that as well. Uh, Eric underscore of the woods. Discuss the best deli style sandwich place in Ottawa. I know that's tough for you, Pilsy. I know Sabito Hive is going to snap app on me but it's big in the castro in the market that's that's my spot right there maybe it's because when i work at blue cactus or when i worked at navara and i had to run over get some quick groceries for the kitchen yeah i was grabbing the focaccia with the salami with uh, the capicolo on there that to me is the best deli sandwich in ottawa pillsy i don't even think you need to weigh in because you haven't had any uh, we've got uh, ragnar wrote in about the quebec city thing and i, I replied with that so that's perfect. That's a nice. first little scoop. We'll do some mailbags later on. We'll give you more than four minutes notice. We just <laughs> put the tweet out. We're like, we need to start with a bit of provocation. And that was great. So I guess. Provocation. Trade, nice. Trade for Is William. that a word? Yeah, for sure. Sweet. We'll look that I'll look that That's up while one. you tell us about our friends. And then we'll, uh, we'll get into our draft rankings. All right. Well, look. If you're hoping to go to playoff games, you're going to have to make a long road trip if you're in Ottawa. So to do that, you need to check out rockauto.com and make sure your vehicle is in tip-top shape. And rockauto.com has all the parts your car or truck will ever need. Visit rockauto.com. They have an easy-to-use website, and you can use it on your computer. You can use it on your mobile device, anywhere you are, at home and in your pocket. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes, models, it's so hard for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. So cut out the middleman. Do it yourself. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. They have the experience. Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer. That's what you like to hear. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com. You are listening to the Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan alongside Brandon Piller here to bring you all the provocation that you need. Pillsy, check this out. We've got the Google definition up there. Can you read this for me, please? Provocation. (laughs) Provocation. Action or speech that makes someone annoyed or angry, especially deliberately. <laughs> I feel like you should put that as part of your Twitter bio, Ross. Sends fans seeking provocation. <laughs> that is dead on. It gets the people going. Rolling around in the mud. Absolutely love to see it. With that, should we roll around in some prospect talk? Because we got some exciting prospects today. And we're actually starting with a kid from my neck of the woods. Ooh. Coming in. At number 38 on our Locked On Senators draft rankings, we are going to, uh, well, he used to be of the M 
JHL. But now we're looking at a USHL stud. He's committed to St. Cloud State. It's six foot two centerman, Adam Ingram. With the Phantoms. That's a that's another name that I don't feel gets used enough. Does uh Phillies, uh farm team still use the Phantom, the Lehigh mm-hmm. Valley Phantom? I think so. Because that, that was pretty cool. But yes, the Youngstown Phantoms. Cool, uh, cool jerseys for sure. Let's get into Adam Ingram. Well, Andrew. they've got they've got a connection with Winnipeg too. You know who's a Youngstown Phantoms alumni? Who? Kyle Connor. Oh, nice. Nice. Yes, hey, sir. some similarities between Ingram and Ooh. Connor, and that similarity is their shot. I mean, this kid can rip the puck. But before we get too far into that, let's go over some of the some of the basic uh, parts of Adam Ingram. If you're watching on YouTube, Ross just pulled up his graphic here. He's six foot two, 165 pounds in 54 games in the USHL. He had 26 goals, 29 assists, good for 55 points. He's committed to St. Cloud State University. And Ross, I'll let you go over the rankings because there is there is quite a range here for Adam Ingram. Well, nothing like we're about to see with the next two prospects on our list, but Chris Peters is the highest on him at 23. Sees him as a first round talent. Bob McKenzie at 32. Scott Wheeler at 35. Elite prospects at 42. And J.D. Burke, their uh, their lead editor, he was banging the table on him. He wanted him more so in the 30s, but they settled at 42 there. And then Craig Button has him at 43. Pilsy, we weren't going to do Adam Ingram today. But Corey Pronman released his full rankings now. He has him all the way down at 74. So that pushed him all the way back to an average of 41.5. But I'm enamored with his shot. And I'm enamored with the way he creates offense. So I'll let you take it from there because his shot is certainly head and shoulders. I would say top five shot in this draft class. Probably the the best we've seen yet. I, I think uh, yes. I'm, I'm comfortable in saying that. Maybe there's some better shots moving forward. But at number 38, Adam Ingrams is the best we've seen yet. He led the Phantom in points 12 more than the next player. And this is... <laughs> This is a guy, Ross, he was passed over in his WHL Bantam uh, season for, for the WHL draft. So he said, all right, I'll stay in the MJHL. And then he decided to go over to the USHL. And I think he's happy about that because he got put in a great situation. And what I like best about him is he has no hesitation letting this puck fly as soon as he receives a pass. A lot of his goals from highlights I saw were from the high slot, even some like at the top of the circle, like it doesn't matter where he is. He's confident enough that he can beat a goalie one-on-one. And he also has a knack for getting on breakaways. He had a bunch of breakaway goals. And I, I think I saw four or five breakaway goals, Ross. And each time, the exact same move. Yeah, And you, you could play them all side by side. And they would time out in synchronization. Because he just goes a little forehand, backhand, deke. And then backhand. And as the goalie's sliding over, he slides it uh, five hole under the goalie. And and it's working. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I would have liked to see a little more creativity there. But if he's scoring goals, I don't blame him for going back to the same old trick. Early on in the season in the USHL, he had a 13-game point streak where he had five multi-point games scattered in there. And then, I mean, he had no points in one game and then started another six-game streak. So throughout the first half of the season, he was absolutely elite. Now, afterwards, he had a stretch of about 12 games where he had three points and then finish strong. So there was that lull in the middle. And then come playoffs, or sorry, come later on the season, I don't even think they made playoffs by the looks of this. They were done April 26th, just looking at his game log here on Elite Prospects. But he was two right games back. in the playoffs, Ross. Okay, so he had one goal in those final two games um, in there. And four shots on goal in the game where he scored nothing in the game he didn't. Now, this is a t- this is a type of player, though, where you're banking on everything else to improve. Like, we talk about his shot. And yes, he was good on a bad team. The skating is is pretty tough. Like the the stride is tough. It's choppy. He played center and wing, but just based on his foot speed. He's a winger. He's a winger. Big now, we, we put C because uh, the NHL Central Scouting has him listed as a centerman. This guy, especially in the NCHC, the, like we followed that closely with North Dakota last few years. That's a good league. He's not going to be able to keep up at center. I don't think so. So I think that as a winger, though, you're looking at a shoot first winger who's got size. So it's how can you mold the rest of the clay to create an effective NHL player? It's it's going to be a challenge, but there is upside there. Yeah, and that's the thing. We, we can only say it so many times. His shot is amazing. All right. 
<laughs> let's that like that's it. Let's move on. Uh, he almost no effort defensively. Like just kind of hanging out. Like he he's not playing hockey. He's playing offense. Yeah. Like, there's no two parts to his game. There's no. no extras. It's like he might as well just be in the skills competition for hardest shot and the accuracy. Uh, the little styrofoam yeah. things that you got to shoot off. There were some clips I was watching where you're and as a centerman try to be in the center of the ice and I look and he's like inches away from the boards and the defense just hanging zone. out <laughs> how'd you get there yeah <laughs> yeah Adam Ingram Ross he reminds me so much of Mike Hoffman like that's <laughs> that's the kind of guy he is Fair. like he we're gonna see highlights of him being turned into a turnstile defensively because he's just gonna hold a stick out ah damn my stick didn't hit the puck ah damn the guy got around me time. ah damn they scored well, maybe I'll get an offensive zone draw next shift. Like yeah. that's that that's kind of it. And it's tough because you guys know I love the type of guy that just put the puck on a stick. He can carry the puck into the zone and from the top of the circle just rips one past the goalie. There we go. Quick goal and we're up yeah. one nothing. I love those guys. But he has nothing else. There's not there's nothing else there. I know. It's too bad because there is some some raw skill there, and he's a good Winnipeg boy, so you love to see that. But also, like, he scored at every level. Here, I'll pull up his uh, – and you know what? Here's something that's working against him as well, Pills. He's one of the oldest kids in this draft class. Mm. He's born October 23rd, so he's one of those late 2003 birthdays who are still – uh, looking to get drafted here. And I, I think that a team will probably snatch him. I think in this, this probably is range, right? Like we're, we're seeing just Pronman had him way below, but everyone else is right before you can become enamored with the size and the shot and be like, Oh, I can fix the skating. It's all good. Right. So uh, August or sorry, October 14th, 2003, big kid still has a lot of room to fill out that frame at six, two, still a light kid. Good West St. Paul, Manitoba. And the scoring here going down to his, uh, to his uh, scoring logs like imagine being his teammate this year man with the winnipeg hawks under 17 32 goals 32 assists in 35 games and that just shows you that his shots just lethal even under 18 and this is playing as an underager right as a 16 year old 15 goals 33 points in 32 games then even jumped up into the junior a level and had almost a point per game so he's been a point per game guy every single year that he's played hockey that's been been uh, tracked on elite prospects. So you got to think that a team's just going to jump at that offensive capabilities. But where do you think he should go? Like in terms of send stars, like what what do you think would be realistic for him? Where you're like, okay, that's good value. Well, before I do that though, Ross, I think his shot being so good has actually been a detriment to his game because he just leans on that. Yeah. Right, he just knows I, I don't have to do a whole lot. My shot is so good, I'm gonna be able to score goals and I'll put up points and I'll look good. I'll just keep doing that. And who cares about the defense if I get 25 plus goals everywhere I go? But eventually, that starts turning into an issue. And coaches care about the defense, teammates care about the defense, scouts care about the defense, and he, he's gonna he's gonna falter off here pretty soon. So for that reason, Ross, and this may seem very underwhelming, but. I got him at two and a half stars for the Sens. Yeah. I, I I don't want the Sens picking him. He's a project. Inside the second round. Like if he he went to, uh, did the Sens have a third round pick? I kind of forget uh... at this point. I think they might. Um, I wouldn't want them picking him with either second round pick because. Two, two third round picks. Yeah. So if they decide to take a flyer on him in the third round. Okay. But I, I'm not going for him in the second round. And if another team does. Good luck to them, but I, I like a shot. Enough said. <laughs> yeah, I've I've got him at three stars, and maybe I pumped him up just a little bit because uh, you know you want to see a, a local kid succeed where I'm living now. Good Ottawa boy, but I, but uh, living out here since uh, since a while, so um, I, I'm a little partial to that. I like the raw tools, but at the same time, like again, we keep going back to it. Skating is is not going to ever become less important. If anything, it's just going to become more and more and more crucial to be able to fly up and down. And I like the Mike Hoffman comparison. He's the guy who went in the fifth round, right? So if you're taking him late and then he figures out skating enough where you're like, all right, now Hoffman skating has been okay. It's more the effort level defensively yes. that we're comparing there. Yeah. Uh, however, yeah, I'm three stars with Adam Rangram. I think that he could be a guy who you slot in as like a, he'll play some games in the NHL, like a call up. But I think we could be looking at an AHL all-star in Adam Ingram. 
All right, before we get back to the countdown, let's tell you about a quick word from our friends at Bet Online. More props, odds, and lines than ever before. Our friends at BetOnline.net are helping you make money. You can bet on anything there, the latest odds, totals, player performance props. You can even bet on where the next fired coach is going to land. Bet Online remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. It's not just one sports, it's all sports at BetOnline.net. So head to the website today. Or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. It's betonline.net, where the game starts. All right, Pilsy. Here we are. Back to the countdown we go. And we are coming in at number 37 with an average rank of 41.33. We're going back to Jurgarden already for the third time. And we've got more to come on this list. It's Cali. Odelius, a defenseman. Cali Odelius, yes, another Jure Garden guy. And there's a lot to like about him. He's a left shot, six feet, about 185 pounds. So an, an average height for uh, for a classic defenseman build. In 43 games in the J20, he had seven goals, 23 assists, good for 30 points. And he did get a cup of coffee in the SHL. Seven games played, zero points. Classic. That's that's how we've uh, really come to know these prospects, uh, getting some pro time overseas. But what I like from him, Ross, is he's able to move the puck well from the top of the umbrella on a power play. I saw him either – he he has a good um, – Good hockey IQ when he's at the top of the umbrella there to be like, okay, is this a passing situation or a shooting situation? And he doesn't often force it one way or another. I, I found he usually made the right choice there. And you know I love this. He uses his wrist shot from the point to create goals, get puck through traffic. And the like. what's the worst that can happen if you take a wrist shot from the point? It gets broken up, but then it's an easy puck to retrieve if you're on the power play for those guys at the bumper position or in front of the net, and they can scoop it up and hopefully bury a rebound, catching a goalie off guard. So I, I really like Odelius here. We have our first top 15 prospect Ooh. from one entity. The Elite Prospects team has him at 14th on their board. I'll tell you why in a moment, but nobody else is that high on him. Tony Ferrari's next at 26. Bob McKenzie at 38. Both Craig Button and Scott Wheeler have him at 49. And Corey Prodman again, pushing him down the rankings all the way at 72. So the average is 41.33, but Pilsy, we got a nice small range to work with just from 14 to 72. That's all somewhere there. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. And, and just for some context, Corey Pronman has him at 72. His 73rd guy is a guy I liked in Ty Nelson. So he has those those two guys way far down, which for me is surprising because I'm a big fan of uh, Odelius as well. And just because he, I, I talked about his wrist shot, his ability to work on a power play. He's a great skater too, especially on his edges. And now maybe you're thinking, okay, this sounds like an offensive defenseman. I wouldn't say that he's a two way guy. Like he uses his hockey IQ to also know when to apply pressure. Like he's good at having that gap control and then waiting for the right time. Then being like, okay, now is the time I really put the pressure on him and I can afford to kind of get out of my zone here and put the pressure on him to try to create a turnover and try to stop this play before it even starts. And he's just able to get into passing lanes and disrupt plays. Like, I really see Odalius as a really good mobile two-way defender. We're going to have to challenge Corey Pronman, who will join us on this show in the lead-up to the draft, because his analysis on Odalius says he's talented in the skating excites scouts, but as a five foot eleven defenseman who is average defensively and isn't dynamic offensively, I'm not sure where he fits in on an NHL team. I would disagree. I think from what I saw, the... The defensive game is is pretty advanced for, for his age. And Elite Prospects thinks the same. Of course, there's going to be a discrepancy there based on where they have them in their ranking. But Elite Prospects and, and their scout from Sweden says he's got great tools and he uses his skating to play strong defensively. Like he closes gaps on guys. Like think think like a less physical Mark Mathot. Like the way he was always able to make up for an offensive defenseman kind of going up into the rush and sometimes being a little too giddy he was able to come back and with strong skating he was able to still hold the line while the uh the unicorn we'll say (laughs) is uh prancing along along the offensive zone and then boom turnover he's right back so i think his skating is something that he uses defensively along with his reach and 
uh, like they called him on elite prospects, a mobile defensive defenseman. I like that term. And he's a guy who I would love the senators to take with that first pick in the second round. Like he is the type of defenseman. Yeah. Say what you want about the Sens having a lot of left shot defensemen over the next couple of years, they're going to have to replenish the entire system, the way they're graduating guys so consistently into the NHL level. I don't think he's ever going to be a guy who puts up 30, 40 points at the NHL level, but he's a guy where his skating will allow him to make his partner better. And that's what you want when you have the defensemen that the senators have in their system. Absolutely. And Rossi, you know what player comparable I came up with uh, for him? Well, yeah, I love your player comparables. (laughs) Yeah, they're great. How about Artem Zub? Like, I feel like he's very similar to Zub where... You know, he's not like what's Zub's dynamic um, attribute? He doesn't he doesn't really have one, but that's fine because he's so smart defensively. And like you mentioned, he's the exact type of defenseman. What did we say all year? Zub is the litmus test for are you a competent defenseman in the NHL? Can you play without him, Zub? Okay, you're good. Can you play without him? No problem. Like it's good. You're going to struggle. So I really think. Zub is a good comparable for him. And to just uh, tack on to what you're saying about the skating, Will Scouch says he might be the most fluid four-way skater in the entire draft. Yeah, so I believe when you're a- able to skate so good with your edges, it just makes makes it so difficult for even a guy with flash formanton type speed. He may blow the wheels off you speed-wise, but if he can't get around you with his edges, who cares? It's He's not going anywhere. So that's really where I like Odalius. And... I would love for the Sens to draft him. I got him at four stars, Ross. Whoa, I'll tease mine. But basically, translatable tools, a high floor. Uh, Our buddy David St. Louis with Elite Prospects says, I don't mind him anywhere between 15 and 50. So (laughs) there's just such a range on this guy. I'm going to be really intrigued in in terms of where he goes. And think about it. They're still so young that, like, even if they grow an inch or two, all of a sudden he's 6'1 instead of 5'11, right? Like, uh, there's always those memes where it's like, what NHL GM C five eleven is Nathan Gerby and six one is, <laughs> is the Dan O'Chara two, next to each other, but it, it's true. I mean, we can laugh at it all we want, but there is a bias towards bigger defensemen. And you saw even from the photo I posted, like he doesn't look small. He's not small, especially compared to like Matthias Havlid, who who we just talked about a little bit while ago. And you can see his profile on the playlist on YouTube, where it's just like there's a lot of diminutive defenseman in this draft so his size will not be used against him at all I think that it's just how much are scouts going to look at his offensive zone lack of creativity he's creative on the breakout from what I saw like he's able to kind of shimmy shake defenseman and and use his skating to to weave out of the zone but once he gets into the offensive zone yeah the offense is is pretty limited but when he plays on the team he did, it didn't affect his points. He's a May 30th birthday. Hey, happy belated. He turned 18 just nice. two days ago. Uh, they've got him listed at six feet on elite prospects. But as we mentioned, we use NHL Central Scouting for all of that. Same uh, hometown, same youth organization as Philip Gustafson as well. And we know the Senators have draft out of Jure Gardens before. Mika yep. Zabanajad, Freddie Clayson. A pair of them, our boy Alex Linscog, a listener of Locked On Senators. He's a good Jure Garden fan, so we love that. He's been a Sense Central citizen. And you see he won gold as well at the under-18s. Pretty much exactly what you'd expect, right, Pilsy? Like, he was a big part of what they did, but still only comes out with three points in six games. Yeah, and that's fair because he does so much away from the box score stat sheet that I don't mind that. And sure, maybe he's not offensively created, but creative but sometimes you need a guy that's just gonna make the quick smart play i all right i got a lane here puck on net blinders on i don't need to think about anything else that's what i'm working oh i got a guy open for a pass here i'll just hit him with a nice easy pass so that's why i like odalius because yeah he reminds me a lot of zub where you're never like holding your head in your hands being like what is he doing out there and that is a comforting thing to have a defenseman like that So I just pulled up, if you're watching on YouTube here, his J20 team stats. And and that's why, like, I think the offensive numbers are pretty inflated, 23 assists, because look how many guys are over a point per game. Like this, for a junior team, was a complete wagon. They had Lekarimaki, they had Ogren, they had Oslin, who we just spoke about. And 
Like, who's this Linden Krantz? 119 pims in a junior Swedish league in 39 games? Wow, Holy yeah. Geez. Oh, my God. Take it easy. No one else Kent. even has 30. No. Oh, no, it was 137. Yeah. Oh, wow. and then he had 20 pims in six playoff games. Take it easy, <laughs> kid. But when I'm looking at, at what he brings, like, top defensive scorer on this team. I mean, two more points than a guy who played two more games than him. So, I mean, he can get the puck in the right spot. I just don't see him as a dynamic player. So you have him at four stars. Yep. I'm going to match you on that one. I think four-star guy is uh, is pretty fair for Cali Odalius because high floor. This guy will be an NHL player. All right, Pilsy, back to the countdown we go. We are coming in at number 36 on our Locked On Senators draft ranking. Coming in with an average of 3857 this kid is unbelievably offensive skill. Gleb Trikazov from the MHL over in Russia. Yeah, Gleb Trikazov is one of the most... Uh, dynamic. Divis- yeah, d- dynamic, but also divisive prospects that we're going to yes. talk about here. And let, let's start uh, with the stats. So like we mentioned, un- unlike a lot of uh, Russian prospects, he got a lot of time in the MHL. He had 35 games. 23 goals, 22 assists for 45 points. And then he did get a bit of time in the VHL, uh, 11 games, one goal, one assist, and no time in the KHL, whereas normally you kind of get a a a sprinkle, yeah, a little taste of KHL action, but uh, not for Gleb Trikasov here. And the thing with uh, Trikasov, it's it's very obvious. Like any, any scout, they all have the same positives about him. He excels. In the transition game and Will Scouch did a great video uh, you guys know I've mentioned him a couple times he does a really great job uh, breaking down prospects and using analytics he described how uh, Trikasov is one of the top guys in zone transitions that he has tracked all year and that he's a gifted puck carrier and I feel like that just bland that's so on brand for Russian hockey, right? Like we all know the the stories of like Russian players coming over and their coaches are like dump it in they're like I I would never, like, I would literally never dump the puck in. Why? I have the puck on my stick. Why would I give it away? I'm going to skate with this until I die. And <laughs> that's why Trikazov is so effective over there because that's probably, and I could be totally wrong, maybe times have changed, but that's what the Russian style coaches want them to do. And he's been able to figure out a way to do it at a high level. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, you mentioned the transition. What does he do at the end of those transitions? He rips pucks. He rips pucks. And we talk about the goal scoring prowess. And yeah, it's impressive. And all 23 goals in 35 games, 45 points, I should should add to that. But like, he is beating goalies from everywhere. It's a shame he didn't get time in the KHL. And even when he played in the VHL, which is the equivalent of the AHL, maybe a little bit watered down. But that to say, he's getting five, six minutes a night. I would have loved to have seen what he could do with that added uh, competition. But the thing with him is he's one of the youngest players in the draft. Late August birthday. So he's still 17 years old. Now, when we're looking at it from a Sens perspective, the last time they drafted a player out of Russia was 2005. Okay, like it's in all likelihood they will not be selecting this. And I'm also curious with everything going on in the political world, where are these Russians going to go in the draft? Like, will they fall further? Like we always have that Russian factor because they're all likely to stay in the KHL for a few extra years. Well, now like McDonald's left Russia, like, there's a big thing going on here that's above our situation here talking about sports on Lockdown Senators. But it does have an effect on what's going to happen. In the CHL, they banned Russians and Belarusians from the import draft. Yep. So it's not like Trikazov can just be like, all right, I'm coming over playing the CHL. Maybe his, his agent can work some magic. I think he's represented by Dan Milstein, who has a lot of the Russian guys Probably. over in, in North America, including Artem Zub, Kucherov, Vasilevsky. Like, basically, if you're a Russian in the NHL, You've got Dan Milstein. So I'm sure he'll pull some strings, but Trikazov needs better competition to go up against. Because as you mentioned with his transition, like get him the puck and he's coming out of his own zone into the offensive zone. It shouldn't be that easy. It really shouldn't. He's over three points per 60 minutes. That is absolutely ridiculous this season for where he's playing. So I think it's it's extremely crucial to see him in a bigger role in a harder situation. And just to show you, like the... Here, you read off these rankings because, again, we're looking at a range here. With Odalius, it was wild. This, to me, is even more wild because our boy Tony Ferrari, who unfortunately he wanted to, just couldn't make time work, 
to come on and defend his ranking of him. But he's got him at 12th. 12th on, on his board. Yeah, that is intense. And Ross, is this the first player we've had where he's ranked by each and every um, uh, one of our entities? Now that I guess now that Corey Pronman has done his rankings, we have more complete. But So Craig Button has him at 33. Bob McKenzie, 64. Wheeler, 46. Pronman, 51. So all those, uh, although there is some range, kind of the ex- same expectations. Then you got Tony at 12. He's very high on him. Peter's back with everyone else at 46. And Elite Prospects at 18. So Elite Prospects and Tony Ferrari kind of in the same uh, mindset here for an average rank of 38.57. What do you think he needs to work on the most? There, there's quite a few things. And that's why it's so hard to judge him properly since he spent so much time in the MHL. That's like a watered down CHL, I think, would be a, a decent comparison there. But he, he turns things up a notch when he has the puck Ross, but isn't quite as involved defensively. Like I, I put in my notes, he's kind of like that kid uh, you play against growing up. That's just, he's just hands down better than everyone through like novice and uh, Adam and, and stuff like that. So he's completely disinterested when he doesn't have the puck. He's like, oh, I'll let those pigeons just like muck it up in the corner. And then when the loose puck comes, I'll go zero to a hundred real quick. And he's just waiting for uh, uh turnover so that his team can have the puck. And, Sometimes he just wants to be a hero out there and he'll get the puck behind his own net and all of his teammates are open. Everyone is ready for a breakout pass. And he's like, nah, you know, I'm just going to force this and I'll carry the puck up ice. And then all the other opponents are like, okay, this guy is not passing for sure. And they just swarm him and he turns the puck over and it's an odd man rush the other way. And his teammates are just like, cool. Thanks, Gleb. (laughs) I want to let that one sit for just a second. Um, Corey Provin says that he can create offense for himself, obviously. Exactly. He's got great That's vision and instincts. Yeah. But uh, then he says the skating's just okay, and his game in general can lack pace. Quote, I waver on his compete level. I've seen him take nights off and other games where he's engaged and works hard on both sides of the puck. Maybe that'll come with age. Again, he's an August 12, 2004 birthday uh, right shot, but like those most Russians, he plays the left wing, so he's open for his one timer, which is absolutely lethal. This guy can rip pucks and has for his whole life. Like I'll pull up here his uh, his elite prospects page as well because it is unreal, especially looking at him at uh, at the younger years, like eighteen goals in twenty one games, five goals in five games, twelve goals in nine games, and then I mean playing in the MHL, the same level he was at this year, but as a 16 year old for the entire season, 15 goals, 30 points in 49 games. So this year was his second year there. And look at the playoffs, yeah. dude. 13 games, 10 goals, 18 points. Like, yeah, the stats look great video game. Like, but like, let's, let's see it against the VHL competition. Let's, I mean, in a perfect world, let's see him come over to, to the AHL. Let, let's really put it to the test in, in a year or two, but no, in all seriousness, I think this guy, he's a project, but one with, ridiculous tools the tools that he has are elite which is why he's getting scouts excited especially ones that value guys who can work in transition super well play give and go get his teammates involved with great vision so there's a lot to like about him but for me he's a three-star guy like i'm somewhere in the middle of the the two extremes where it's like you know what if the sense took him at 39 cool that's a great range. I mean, Tony will be doing backflips. He might switch in his his uh, Red Wings jersey and throw get back on the sicko train. Who knows if they were able to take him there? But to me, he's a guy. Yeah, great tools. But I I'm of the mind that Sens need to draft like elite skaters this draft. Like I need skating to be the number one attribute of the players that the Sens take. And for me, Gleb, his elite, elite, elite skill is his shot. And uh, to me. I think a team will be extremely happy with him. And if you're listening to this right after your team selected him, congratulations. I'm sure he'll be a very good player. But for the Senators, again, very adverse to drafting Russians at the best of times. Igor Sokolov, the only Russian player they've drafted in, wait for it, the last 17 years. And that was out of the queue, not out of Russia. Yeah, I don't think it's very likely that he is an Ottawa Senator on July 7th. Yeah, Ross, I'm also down on uh, Gleb here because I... I will, again, I'll echo all his elite uh, offensive toolkit stats, but I'm really worried that this is a guy that's going to be stuck in his ways. And like you mentioned, 
Who knows what's going to happen with Russian imports coming over. So he's going to be even more stuck in his ways, playing more time in Russia, more puck possession uh, type game. And like he just lacks pace defensively. Like Will Scout showed a clip, Ross, where he's literally, and I mean this literally, standing still in the defensive zone. I counted it four seconds. And that may not seem a lot to you, but think about watching a clip in hockey and going one, two, three, Mm -hmm. four. And he hasn't like, not even like, not even like shuffled or anything. He's literally one stick, one hand on a stick, just sitting there, just watching. And you can't be doing that. That's not the way the Sens play hockey. And I'm just so worried that teams are going to just totally go crazy for his offensive toolkit, which is great. And he has that toolkit. But I don't think he's going to change, and I don't think he's going to learn. So I have him at two and a half stars. I really, I, I, I wouldn't be that stoked if the Sens drafted him, honestly, just because I feel like he doesn't fit with what they're trying to do. And I think another team, like I wouldn't be surprised, Ross, if we see the Carolina Hurricanes yes. jump all over this guy. Because wait, where's we, Wheeler? Have him ranked? Yeah, <laughs> good forty-six. Question. Okay, so because his advanced stats are. Are great offensively they're so great like it, it unbelievable almost but they're believable because he doesn't give a damn about defense or any other stats so that's why uh I, i'm i'm lower so two and a half stars for me all right well there you have it gleb trikazov a two and a half star for you three stars for me but there are people who are smashing their keyboard saying how can you not love gleb trikazov seems like a cult classic from this draft class All right, Pilsy, before we wrap up, let's have a quick discussion on last night's game. I'm sure people have heard it from a million different ways or a million different people, but offside, right? I don't understand the rule, clearly. (laughs) Like, like if that, I know there was like a million, like, little, like, quick, like, well, actually guys that (laughs) chimed in, but I don't understand the rule there. No, I'll just be honest. Me neither. If that's how it is, then I don't get it. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Because I feel like people are sick of hearing about the the offside call. Yeah, I just that's fun hockey. Like I, I was I was kind of in and out of the game. I wasn't fully watching it. I had the Oilers, so I, I was stoked Oof. at times and sad at times. Um, but how about the way they kept giving up the lead right when they got it? I know. That's why <laughs> I was like, uh, I was like, ooh, smart bet for me. Five seconds later damn, I'm an idiot. Like, what was I thinking? And then again, I'm like, oh, they're right back in it. No, no, they're out of it. And for teams, for both teams in game one of a, of a conference final series, Ross, to have to go to both goalies, that's that's crazy. Like, I wonder how many times that's happened. I have no idea. Wow. What a game, though. If that Okay, I tweeted out from, from my account here. What would the score have been in that game? if the goalies were Vasilevsky and Shosturkin? Because I don't even know if it would have been that much less. I thought Mike Smith, the first goal was brutal. But other than that, like he let in six goals and I couldn't really find blame on him for that many. Yeah, I don't... I don't, I don't know how that would have gone. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how tonight goes, Ross. And I have a parlay Let's for tonight's go. game. Wait, didn't you win the last one? I did not. I'm on a, I'm on a bit of a... Yeah, I keep telling you that. I love you the pump-ups, Ross. And maybe one time I'll, I'll just sneakily be like, yeah, I did. And just feel good about myself. But uh, it's, not, it's not looking great for me recently. So let's get back on the saddle here. Five and ten. Five and 15 ten parlays, thirty three percent. Like you're wavering on, like this is probably still a bit above average for parlays, but you're really teetering on that average rate. I know. I've been like I was, I was five and five at one point, I think. So like I've really slipped down here. But in my opinion, in the playoffs, rest is not a weapon. I think the Tampa Bay Lightning have been off for too long. They swept their little brothers, the Florida Panthers, way too easily. The New York Rangers had to scratch and claw for everything they had. So I think the Rangers come out flying with that adrenaline, that hunger. And I'm taking their money line at plus 114. And then we've already talked about it. It's the two greatest goalies going head to head. So I'm taking the under, even though it's kind of a lame position. Goalie friendly show, though. The under is set at five and a half at minus 121. Put 10 bucks in, you're going to win $29.09. That is Pillsy's playoff parlay of the day. Ride with them or fade them, but do it all at betonline.net and don't bet the under in any of the Oilers versus no, Colorado Avalanche games. All right, we'll be back tomorrow. More draft rankings heading down 
towards the first round of draft ranking prospects. For today, we say goodbye for Brandon Piller. I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day.